All right, thanks for the invite. Um, I'm going to run through a little bit of the, you know, what are we going to do when we actually have a disease like African swine fever come to the United States, which is, let's just keep it out because it's a pretty depressing picture if we don't. Why do we even care? So the World Organization for Animal Health is the international body that sets the rules on how we play, uh, work well and play nice with one another uh, based upon our disease status. And so African swine fever, classical swine fever, and foot and mouth disease are on this magic list. When you're on the magic list, that means things happen to you if you have it, bad things. When we had PED, there was no regulatory response to that. Why? Not on the list. ASF is on the list. What ends up happening is if we get foot and mouth disease, um, we're going to lose export. We're going to lose exports if we get CSF, and we're going to lose exports if we get ASF. We funded some work at Iowa State University with Dermot Hayes in 2011, and actually the billions of dollars have gone up, I'm sure, because the value of our industry has gone up. But if you look with FMD, if we're the first case in the United States, this is just the revenue that comes off the top. This isn't response cost. This is just what we lose. So pork, $57 billion over 10 years, beef, 71. Poultry, poultry don't get FMD. Why would they lose money? They lose money because we'd have so much cheap pork back on the U.S. market, we would outcompete them at the store. Corn loses 44 billion, soybean 25 wheat. The take home on these slides, and I've got a few more, is that we're all in this together. We get ASF. It's not just the pork industry that ends up suffering. It's all of the different industries that feed into the pork industry, our corn and soybean friends. You know, it's a bad deal all across the board. African swine fever, as Dr. Spront pointed out, you see these things every day. You see these lesions every day. And you're not going to trip, you're not going to trip the trigger because, heck, that ear up there looks like salmonella. So that's scary to me when I hear about the epidemiology of this disease in China and that you've got, you know, it in a production system for two weeks before they know it's there. And then you go post it and you spread virus everywhere. Again, billions, right? Look at ASF for beef. Why? Because cheap pork is going to affect beef at the market. We're going to outcompete beef. You look at classical swine fever, and uh, this is actually one uh, disease we do have an active surveillance program for, which is good. That means it's looking in the background. But again, billions. So specific to ASF, there is a plan, and you can go to USDA's FAD prep website, and there is a ASF strategy. There's a strategy for CSF. There's one for FMD. One resource for you guys um, at our, uh, if you go to pork.org backslash FAD, we have a foreign animal disease preparation checklist. This is a list that's basically the actionables taken out of a, the national plan is, hey, if you do these things today, if you go down the list and you check the box and make sure they're done, you're doing about everything you can from a preparedness standpoint to get yourself ready. The day of an outbreak, Dr. Spronk, he said stand still, and that's exactly right. So coming out of, I used to work for the Department of Ag uh, as a, a veterinarian there, and the only tool that a state vet's got today for these type of diseases is to try to lock movements down. And the reason that we have to throw a really big net is because we don't have enough data to do anything different. You guys make decisions using data all the time. You guys will overanalyze data in order to make the right decision. Well, state vets need the same luxury. Unfortunately, one of our weaknesses that we have is our inability to share data in a meaningful way uh, to drive information for different actions than just, hey, we got to stop everything. So my assumptions, the day that we have ASF, all your production sites that fall within a disease control area, you're going to be quarantined. All your movements are going to stop. Um, if this is FMD, it's all susceptible livestock, so it would be cattle, sheep, uh, and swine. But with ASF, it's just the pigs. Our movements aren't going to get going again until the state vet can link together the information that they need to determine where the disease is and where the disease isn't and get a good feel about their disease control area. The tool that they use is a control area. There's an infected zone and there's a buffer zone. There's a surveillance zone around that. The infected zone and buffer zone are the make up the area of the most attention. Now, you put that in Sioux County, Iowa, and you're going to wrap up a lot of people in there that don't have the disease. If you've got one person there, everybody else around is under the same disease control. 
One thing that's concerning, I've been to a lot of uh, regional meetings now, it's amazing um, how popular you get when ASF is a big issue. The regional meetings are concerning from the standpoint of I'm not sure that we're standardized across all states as to what exactly each state vet's going to do. If you go and read certain plans, their plans are, I don't care if it's in North Carolina or Florida, I am stopping movements in Iowa. And so what I'm telling producers on the planning side right now is you've got to be prepared for not being able to do any business outside a certain geographical area for a while. It's all nice when you've got a nice little control area and that's 10 kilometers and you think you got all wrapped down, but when you've got states that have different ideas of what they're gonna do with movements, um, it runs into no consistency across state lines, which is scary, especially with the way we move pigs today. So the pork industry has been one of the leaders for premises registration, which is great. Getting a dot on the map, getting the contact information, great. And that's the data elements that's captured with that. So today, if we're drawing a control area in Minnesota, that's really all the state vet needs from a data perspective, or has from a data perspective to know where farms are. Now, if you work with your databases, you know that your data is only as good as the last time it was updated. There's a real challenge in that the states are having uh, challenges keeping these databases you know, up and accurate. The farm that was registered 10 years ago is probably not owned by the same person, or the pigs that are in there are probably owned by somebody different. What the state vet actually needs is the ability to really get granular, and they need to know where their sites are. But on those sites, they need to have animal numbers, they need to have all the movements, and they're going to go back 28 days at a minimum on your movements. And then you need to know everywhere that those pigs have gone, and you also need to know a status. Today we are ASF free. Hooray. We have ASF tomorrow. Now you've got to prove your status. You've got to prove your negative. Every pig with a purple ear is going to be ASF till proven otherwise the day that we have it. So you've got to do that for your sow farms. You've got to do it for your finishers. All of this information is stuff the state animal health needs, animal health official needs, in order to make good decisions on movements. Another area that we have concern is that um, from the standpoint of, of records, the packer and the producer really are the only people that have the record of what moved to slaughter that day. That's not a regulated movement. It's not on a, a health paper anywhere. And so when you look at producer data, it's the most authoritative source on all movements. We don't have any national mandated you know, pre-harvest traceability program that covers all movements intrastate and uh, across state lines. So the producer actually has that responsibility because that's where the most authoritative source on movement is. So the common denominator for us as an industry has been this PREM ID because if you hook things to it, if you hook data to that, and then you build a cool little computer system, you can actually start doing some pretty cool stuff with the information that you've hooked together. So one thing that my, my call to action for you guys today is you can go to our, our pork.org website to our premises verification. Go in there and pop your prem IDs in there. If the street address that's returned is not the street address where your pigs are, you need to call the state vet and get it updated in their database. You can do them batch, 99 at a time, or you can do them singly, uh, each website. Uh, the, the batch one, you can just download a spreadsheet and upload it and it'll, it'll do that. But the other cool thing is it'll give you a barcode that's validated, so you can start sticking barcodes on things. I'm, I'm a little, uh, uh, pop culture, hey, if you want to move it, put a pin on it. And that's really what we need to do. We need to hook all of our movement data and all of our um, testing data. Uh, we need to hook all that together by PREM ID. Pin tags are an industry requirement, not a federal requirement, but a state or an industry requirement. And again, you're delivering a validated PREM to somewhere where it could be captured and used to benefit the industry. We need to make sure that we're putting our PREM IDs in our movement records and that those movement records are held within a kind of electronic format that makes it easy in order to share it. Same thing with health papers. We've got to put a PREM IDs on those, sending and receiving. Bills of lading, we've got to throw those on there. That's important too. And probably one of the more important ones is it's got to go on that diagnostic laboratory submission form. PED taught us that. You can't judge how much PED you got in the country from an accession number. We didn't have site, we, didn't, we had no clue on how many actual sites. So that drove a lot of the PREM ID uh, use on diagnostic laboratory submission forms, and so did actually getting, um, that's how you got your money out of USDA on the PED. 
I'm hearing that some of this has decreased in the, you know, the use of PRIM IDs on forms because the, program, the PED program is over, but um, I want to encourage everybody to make sure that you, if you're the veterinarian or your veterinarian, is using PRIM IDs on your forms. And why, do we, why is that important? So we were talking about surveillance programming. We can do a lot with surveillance just through the normal business process. So if we've got PREM IDs on the front on, on our sows, and we're putting PREM IDs on our bills of lading, and then we're putting PREM IDs on our diagnostic laboratory submission forms, as those samples are entered into our surveillance programs, you can start linking things together. And over time, you could even potentially get a status. And so that's why we want to try to drive this type of uh, attachment of PREM IDs to the information that the state vet would need. This is a big deal. I, I go to all the meetings I've gone to right now, and the people's faces are ashen when you start thinking about how would ID pop 16,000 sows. And so there's a lot of good resources. Actually, North Carolina's got a, a very nice resource on depopulation for uh, uh, mass depop events. I encourage you to go take a look at that. Um, but this is, when I was working for the state in 2001 with FMD, this was a problem, figuring out how we handle this, and it's still a problem today. I know a lot of work is going on at the state level in order to try to address these things right now. Same thing with disposal. Environmental persistence of this virus, disposal gets a little tricky. You're going to have to do something, from my perspective, something to get that virus load knocked down or have it get knocked down over time. Is that composting? Is that some other way that you can handle those carcasses? All I see in China with all of that is just big piles of virus, right? If you can go to the wild boar in, in Lithuania and one that's died and fully decomposed and crack open that bone and get the virus back out, that's a pretty good virus. You've got to give the virus a little bit of respect for being able to do that. But here's the bigger issue, and, and this is where I think pork producers will excel. I call it horse trading, because if you're locked down in a disease control area and you've got a sow farm and you're negative and you need to place pigs or you're going to have a welfare disaster, you guys got to start talking to one another. And, and you guys talk today, you guys share resources, um, and so we need to think about that. So when I tell producers about planning, think about what you can do in a 10-kilometer zone. And then what can you do if you can move within your county? And then what can you do if you move within your state? And then what about if I can't move to Iowa, but I can go to South Dakota? So those are, I mean, with the inconsistencies across uh, state lines, what I think will happen, you're going to have to really work on the fly in order to get this thing done. And so... You guys got the relationships. Now it's time to take those relationships and visit with your state animal health officials and find out, you know, hey, if we're in this situation here, can we do X? Can we do Y? Can we do Z? Because I've got a big problem with putting protein in the ground that we can eat. And I want to make sure that we're doing everything we can do to make, turn those things into pork chops instead of trying to depop and dispose of them. Secure pork supply, hopefully you've heard about it. I know Minnesota's done an outstanding job with promoting it, especially the regional meetings. I got to attend one. This is a voluntary program for producers. Basically, you're preparing yourself. It's like pre-check for the airport or global entry. You are preparing yourself to be in the best position to move pigs when the state vet allows you to move them. It isn't a get-out-of-jail-free card. What it is is a preparedness uh, step and that you can go to securepork.org, Click on the producer tab, follow the list down, and get in compliance with the secure pork supply plan. One of the things that we're doing at National Pork Board, our, our board has uh, provided $8.5 million to develop a database and dashboard, which is called AgView right now, or that's the name of it is AgView. What this tool will allow is the ability for producers to be able to take the data that they need to share with animal health official upload it into the database where the state animal health officials can actually visualize it in what I call a common operating picture. So it'll allow basically taking tables and turning them into shapes on the map and information on the map where you can visualize what you need to do in order to help support your producers in a disease control area. Here's the landing page for Secure Pork. Encourage everyone to go there and take a look at that. Encourage everyone to uh, start working through the program standards. This is just a screenshot of AgView, the Explorer view, where a lot of producers would be able to do a lot of their uh, manipulation of the data in the system. This is what a state vet could do and draw their circles and all that. So May 1st is the initial release of this product. Um, it will be specific to having something tomorrow if we have ASF. There will be enhancements to the product over the next year. 
Um, but I'm pretty excited about where that is going. It's been a real interesting event to work with tech people and try to teach them pork and then try to teach pork people about technology. But it's been a worthwhile endeavor. Again, if you go to pork.org backslash FAD, everything that we've been putting together for ASF, CSF, FMD, preparedness, uh, all of that's in that one landing page. So.